you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thechrisvossshow.com. Welcome to the big show. Oh, family and friends are Chris Voss Show family. The family that loves you, but doesn't judge you, at least not as harsh as your mother when you burn down her favorite plant. I don't know what that means. Does anybody do that? I don't know. Maybe somebody did that as well. You know, I was sitting here in the uh, intro, always trying to think of what I'm going to improv on what they call the ramble. I think that's a technical term in the business. I don't know. Somebody told it to me from France once. They're like, I like watching the rambles. I just go through and listen to all the intros. Um, and I was thinking to myself, you know, Justin Bieber has the the Biebers, or what, is, it, is it the Bieberettes? What, what are they? Do, do you know what they're called, Karen? I don't, but I have a little Bieber fever, so there, there that's, all, that's all I know about. Yeah, yeah, so he has those people, and I think uh, there's a few other different rock stars that have like a thing. And I was listening to the intro, and I was thinking, maybe the Chris Foss show has the brain bleederettes, or the brain bleeders. That's what fans wow. are, the Chris Foss show, the brain bleeders. Oh, so, we could be like cheerleaders. I actually have... Um, Cheerleaders Some, are the brain bleeders. The branded pom-poms there you go. right here. So there you I'll go. be your little cheerleader today. <laughs> cheerleaders are the brain bleeders. Uh, <laughs> brain bleeders coming to a, uh, a concert tour opening for Sting next week. Uh, the brain bleeders uh, and uh, featuring, I don't know who the hell's at the helm of that. Anyway, moving on. We have an amazing uh, author and brilliant mind on the show. And of course, none of them are me. So that's why we have guests so that we can have smart people on the show to educate you guys, make you guys smarter, not make you. I mean, we don't want to force you or anything, but we're going to coerce you in a very uh, casual and very uh, inviting way that where you're going to be like, do you want to be smarter? You could, you could be smarter if you listen to this show. And you're like, uh, if you're not going to force me, I'll go ahead and do it. Uh, as always, folks, uh, we'll get to her in a minute and her amazing book and what she's written. She's written a few books. Uh, but in the meantime, go to goodreads.com, for Chess Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, for Chess Chris Foss, YouTube.com, for Chess Chris Foss, and guilt and shame your family and friends to subscribe to the show uh, that we can do that. Uh, someone already from the audience is saying, no, that's not our fan names. Well, um, Jennifer, thanks for dialing in. I guess you should come up with whatever the fans are for the Chris Foss show name. Today, we have an amazing author on the show. Karen Friedland joins us on the show. Her newest book that just barely came out, uh, September 19th, 2023, Grab Life by the Dreams is its title. And we're going to be talking to her about what's in there because you know what? We all have dreams. We all need to grab them more because uh, I've seen a few of us. We're not fulfilling our dreams as much as we think we'd like. Uh, Karen Friedland is a certified life reinvention coach who coaches highly achieving women looking to achieve success without sacrifice and make their dreams a reality. She's also a speaker, a podcast host, and award-winning author. Her new book, Grab Life by the Dreams, empowers women to build a regret-proof and intentional life. Uh, she is a wife and mother residing in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, so there you go. Welcome to the show, Karen. How are you? I'm awesome. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. There you go. I almost went into a new line where you're like, uh, you had some other details there, but uh, I got the bio out. So welcome to the show. Give us your .com so people can find you on the interwebs. Absolutely. It's KarenFreeland.com and Karen is K-A-R-I-N, Freeland, mm -hmm. F-R-E-E-L-A-N-D. Um, so go there. And if you check out KarenFreeland.com forward slash dreams, it will give you all the information about the book. There you go. And you've written three different books, right? Um, well, two. And one I was okay. a part of was more of a compilation of, of artists. Um, so, yeah. So I had a memoir that I came out with first, which was mm -hmm. uh, something I sort of fell into. I didn't know I was actually going to become an author and write books. And then with this second book, it was the book I wish I had when I was going through my midlife crisis. So I was very intentional about this second one. Ah, now this is the, the midlife crisis one is the new one, right? Yeah, that's right. There you go. Uh, give us the title of your first one, your first book. Okay, you ready for this, everybody? Are you sitting down? It is called The Ins and Outs of My Vagina, A Penetrating Memoir. And I will say it is penetrating. 
There you go. You can order up wherever fine books are sold. And my comic yeah. brain is going to move on to your amazing books if you want to feature. Uh, so uh, what motivates you want to write this book, Grab Life by the Dreams? Yeah, sure. So like I said, this is the book that I wanted when I was asking all the big questions in my life. Mm. So I know it's hard to believe, but at 39, I had basically peaked in my midlife crisis. Mm. And I was asking all the questions like, is this all there is to life? What is my purpose? Why was I put here on earth? Can it really be to make PowerPoint presentations all day and try to justify my existence to other people? I don't think so. But I didn't really know where to go for like, where do you go with that? I'm the breadwinner, right? Like I want, I'm just supposed to walk away from a six figure salary and do what? I don't have some hobby that I can go make money at. Like, you know, a Serena Williams or somebody who's got like a skill, like a talent. Mm -hmm. I was like, what, what would I do? And I really set off on this self-discovery journey. And in the process of doing that, that's kind of how I wrote the first book was, hey, I have this really funny story to tell, um, a coming of age story. Let me put this out there and see where it goes. And as I started writing the book and it was, I was getting great feedback on it. I was like, wait a second, like this is, this is real. I could actually do this. I could be an author. And I was getting excited about life again. I thought, okay, I'm onto something. Like mm -hmm. what's my new purpose? And during all of that, I realized, you know what? I want to coach other women to go through the kind of transformation I just went through so they can get out of the driver's seat of their life or out of the passenger seat and get back into the driver's seat. There you go. All the joy happens. So I realized, though, with the first book, it wasn't necessarily leading into the coaching. Like it wasn't mm -hmm. like it was like, hey, I went and did this thing. I've walked the walk. Right. I had a dream. I fulfilled it. I can show you how to do that. But then it was like, wait, I got to tell them how. And, mm -hmm. you know, coaching is great, but not everyone can afford coaching. Coaching isn't accessible to everyone. Not everyone's comfortable with coaching. So mm -hmm. how can I take this message and this process and bring it to more women and have a bigger impact? And that's how Grab Life by the Dreams really came to fruition. There you go. And the subtitle, I guess, or the subline of this is The Essential Guide to Getting Unstuck and Living Your Purpose. And a, a lot of us come to that midlife in life where they go, why, why, you know, who am I? Why am I here? And what the hell's going on? And do I still want to do this? I think. Is that yeah. what a lot of people are reaching for you find in midlife? Still, a hundred percent. And midlife is such a eh, word because a lot of people think of midlife and they go fifties, sixties. But do we ever know when we're midlife? I mean, unless you've been given your expiration date, I don't know, right? No. If I don't know, am I going to get run over by a truck at fifty? Well, then crap, I'm way past midlife. I'm in the final quarter, right? Mm -hmm. We don't know, and so. In a way, I hate to use the term midlife, but I don't have a better way to describe it. It was just those big questions. And the women that I work with, they're all different ages from as young as 25 up to 67. I mean, it's like I got a wide gamut here mm -hmm. and they're all coming to me saying the same thing. Like, what's next for me? This thing that oh. used to bring me joy and passion. It's not there for me anymore. Wow. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Now you talk about uh, well, hold on, let's uh, let's back up just a little bit to what we like to do sure. on the show. We like people to get to know you a little bit better. Tell us yeah. about your origin story, your history, uh, how you grew up, and kind of mm -hmm. what got you down this road that you've arrived at. Yeah, so I grew up in a little town in upstate New York called Vestal. Um, I was a dancer competitively. I was cheerleader, so I've always had this much energy. It's not just <laughs> an anomaly. And the pom poms. Um, Yes. And the pom poms. And, you know, I, I just was a social butterfly. I always loved to be around people, to motivate other people. Um, you know, public speaking has kind of always been my jam. Mm -hmm. And after school, I really wanted to pursue my dreams. And so I went to college as a dance major mm -hmm. and then afterwards moved to Florida, was in Miami for about two years. I uh, got some some good traction and some films and things and figured, you know what, let's go to New York. Like, let's do it in, in the real market. And there came a point during my acting journey where, you know, like all starving artists, you go, okay, something has got to give. I, I need to make some more money and actually have some food on the table. So I got this crazy idea that I was going to quit waiting tables and I was going to go get a job for one year, save up all my money, and then go back to acting. Mm -hmm. Well, I got a job selling Blackberries at T-Mobile and I got that first commission check and it was four numbers. I'd never seen so much money on a check before. And I was like, well, let's 
let's go to the coach <laughs> store. And so I got what I say is addicted to the money drug. Mm. And the rest is kind of history from there. It was like an addiction in me. Like, what is the next title I could get? How much money could I get paid in my next job? And I was constantly gunning for that next rung on the ladder. And I did that for about 15 years, uh, chasing paychecks and titles until, you know, it all came crushing down in a, in a midlife crisis. And I was like, this is not working. What am I doing? There you go. And you talk about uh, how to ditch the golden handcuffs on your website mm, and yeah. build a purpose-driven life. What are, what are golden handcuffs? I had to ask you that in the green in the green room. Yeah, and it's such a fascinating term. And I remember the first time I heard it, and a, a guy in, in, that I was working with, he was a big director at our tech company, and he said he would leave, but the golden handcuffs. And so the golden handcuffs is this idea of staying in a job that you're actually not happy in, but the benefits are great, the money's great, and so you stay in it anyway. And mm. I remember feeling so sad for him, mm. like, Oh, that's so sad. You don't actually want to be here, but you just do it because of the golden handcuffs. Wow. And then I realized a few short later, years later, oh my gosh, I'm that guy now. Like I'm the one with the golden handcuffs on. And it's it's quite a process. They are not easy to get off because we are so trained, you know, when you're living that corporate workaholism life that, mm -hmm. you know, 24-7, you feel so valued in a way by your productivity and your output. You know, mm -hmm. the busier I am, the more valuable I must be, right? And mm -hmm. it's a toxic connotation to tie those two things together. Plus, you build a lifestyle around that. You counsel a lot of people in the high-achieving yeah. corporate realm, and they've got that six-figure salary. You get trapped by it. You know, yes. I, I grew up poor, and I started my first company 18 and I, you know, I wanted everything, you know, all the, mm -hmm. all the things I grew up seeing when I was a child in North Hollywood. And, um, and I thought that would fix all my problems because I, I had a few issues. I know that's surprising to most people, uh, because clearly I've resolved all of them now. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we all? Right now my psychiatrist is texting me. Um, <laughs> he's like, I need to see you next week. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, it's a daily thing. Actually, I should probably admit to that. But uh, I wanted everything. And the problem was I got all that stuff and I built this huge life with with homes and, and cars and everything else. And and it became uh, the, that line from Fight Club where the things that you own end up owning you. Yeah. And then it became, you know, this uh, this this, uh, you know, you, you have to make all the payments and feed all the machines and pay all the things and, you know, and, and, uh, and, and you have to keep that lifestyle that you've yeah. raised up, you know, at, at a six figure salary, you know, you can live kind of fairly well in this world. I think it depends yeah. on how, how you're on the six figures, but it, it, or where you're on your tax base. That's my biggest problem. No wife and no kids. Uh, <laughs> I need to find some dependents. Anybody want on the Chris? Yeah, there you go. Can, can I write off dependents, <laughs> the listeners? Um, but, uh, and so, you know, I reached a point where I was like, holy crap, everything I own ends up owning you. And so, as you mentioned, the golden handcuffs, you're trapped in that lifestyle because you can't just quit your job and just go like, ah, I just, I'll just leave and go, I don't know, uh, farm right. lettuce for a living or something. Right. Right. You can and you can't. Right. But there is a process to make that actually happen where you'd be comfortable enough to do something like that. Right. Like I never tell my clients unless they're really, really in a toxic environment and it is wearing on their physical health and their mental health to a point where it's not it's dire straits. Um, otherwise, I would never say just like, oh, up and quit your job. Right. And that's why the book is so great, because it's going to walk you through the process that you need to take to get from point A to point Z of where oh. you really want to be intentional, uh, intentional about being. Mm -hmm. There you but go. I love what you said um, about the things, you know, owning you and stuff. And so, so many of the women that I work with, they feel guilty because they are in a blessed place. And on paper, their life looks so good, right? It's like they've got the six-figure salary. They've got the bends in the driveway. They got the nice house and the marriage and the kids. But actually, you know, the marriage is on a little on the rocks right now because they're not connecting and having time for that. Uh, their kids are constantly like, mommy, get off the phone. Mommy, pay attention to me. And then she's torn in both directions. Do I spend time with my kids or do I drop the ball at work? Like, you know, and so it's, it's, this like toxic situation that we're in and we have so much guilt. And so I'm really yeah. 
also admitting that like it's okay to feel guilty and yeah. there's a way out right we can work through gratitude and you know i teach some exercises and things in the book that are going to help with that type of stuff there you go i get guilty about not spending time with my two dog children uh yeah. and i think guilt is okay uh i mean you you back me up or tell me on this what you think but i think guilt is okay because it's a signal that says hey maybe you're not happy maybe there's something you can improve here and you know maybe you should just send the kids off to military school till they're 18. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. You know, I, I love to talk to my clients about signals. I had a, a woman recently, high achieving corporate woman. Uh, she's chief of staff. And she was like, why am I not able to control my emotions at work lately? And I'm like, that's your alarm bells. That is your internal, you know, soul telling you this isn't right. This isn't right. And it's, you're not listening to it. So now the signals are getting louder and louder. And I experienced a ton of that self-sabotage uh, when I was in corporate toward the end. I was just so toxic. And I would say things in meetings. And as the words would come out of my mouth, I knew. I'm like, don't say that. Don't say that. I'm like, well, I just said it. Damn it. How do I walk that back? We just sent the missiles. Uh, yeah. Someone on someone writing the show, Matthew, uh, Why do they? what do they call the entrepreneur handcuffs? We still have the same workaholic mindset. In fact, we might be worse. Oh. I don't know. Um, is it probably, I mean, golden handcuffs can still be that, I guess. Uh, perhaps. I guess I, I'm curious. So a lot of the workaholism for me early in the business carried over. It was an old habit that I really had to do a lot of work around. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started, my coach, my business coach asked me, Karen, what do you want your life, your new business life to look like? And I was like, I don't want to work Fridays. And then Friday came around and I, people would be like, hey, let's hop on a call or I want to do this. And I'd look at my schedule and be like, well, I'm wide open on Friday. And I'd start plugging in calls and <laughs> fill in the day that I was supposed to be off enjoying. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, OK, I got to walk this back. Let's take a baby step. How do I mm -hmm. take a half day on Friday? Just mm -hmm. like if I can honor not working from one to five on Fridays, like, OK, let's get that. And then once I got really comfortable with that, I was able to walk it back and do the full no Friday. So now I work Monday through Thursday. Mm. Um, so this is, you know, just I don't know the, about the entrepreneur handcuffs, what those would be called. That's a new term. That's interesting. Uh, but I, yeah, those old habits definitely die hard. I think I have the answer for you. Uh, Matthew, exactly. We're worth X worth ethic does not change when you leave the corporate world uh you know what you know what i think they call uh uh, uh a business owner uh, ceo handcuffs that are workaholic mindsets uh matthew it's just called being an entrepreneur baby it's 24 7 man it doesn't change uh i don't know man i don't have a good answer <laughs> Uh, he says, I started taking Fridays off on that Saturday. I'll be back to work and mindset. You know, recently I started doing a little bit of burnout because we did, we did 65 mm. shows, 655 shows last year. We just hit our annual fiscal, uh, with the numbers on, um, August 30th of this year, 2023. <clears throat> And we actually had some really slow months. Uh, we did the big CES show, and I was fried from CES for the week of CES. Um, and we didn't have a lot of shows that month. I remember February was slow. So we actually probably should have been, I don't know, seven or 800 shows. And we're pushing to go to 1,000 this year. But I, I've been really fried lately at uh, at everything we've been doing. And it, it occurred to me that my studio is in my home. And while I've worked mm -hmm. out of my home since 2014, like all these people in COVID, they're like, we're working at our home. I'm like, I've been here for a while. Go away. I, leave me alone. I, this is my space first. Um, I started really experiencing burnout because we're doing more and more in the shows. It's gotten more successful. And I've just kind of learned that what I have to do on Saturdays and Sundays is I got to leave, man. I got to mm -hmm. go to the place. I got to get a bed and breakfast. I got to go out to some fine dining. I go travel in the countryside. And I need more peace. I also was listening to... Uh, <clears throat> Sam Harris's podcast. And there was somebody talking on there about how one of the problems we have is we're always trying to find stuff to keep us busy. You know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, I, I'm really bad. I'll take my phone to go, you know, make a salad and I'll yes. take my phone so I can watch a YouTube video. I'll, I'll go in the shower and I'll play the podcast, a podcast that I want to listen to or an audio book, the same thing at the gym or in the car. And somebody, uh, one thing the, the guy with them there was talking about was we need more, a little bit more stillness. Just to mm -hmm. like listen to ourselves. And that's usually where I come up with my best ideas. So I started turning those some of those things off. Like now in the car when I drive to the gym, I just kind of 
look around, I look at the scenery and I just kind of spend a little bit more peaceful time with myself and I find myself kind of reflecting on my life, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know. Those are some. I love that. I think yeah. that's great guidance. And I talk about it in the book in this chapter four with turning inward, right? We're so focused on what everyone else is doing, what everyone else thinks we should be doing. And, you know, there is research and I can't come up with a study right off the top of my head, but where when someone else picks up their phone, you instinctively want to pick up your <laughs> phone. Like, like you're, there's nothing in there. No, you didn't get a ding, but because someone else has looked at their phone, you feel you have to check yours. And we don't realize how many of these habits and things we pick up from the people that we are around. And so I talk all about the, the need to go inward and just put on your blinders, get your journal out, have a conversation with your inner critic, have a conversation with your soul and ask yourself, what is it that I find joy in? What do I need to be able to walk away comfortably? Why do I feel like I can't stop working for one weekend? You know, what, what is the need to feel like I have to be producing, producing, producing? And I think you get a lot of insights from those things, from doing those types of exercises. There you go. There you go. I'm laughing, uh, not at you, but someone wrote in, uh, Chuck, uh, great. I'm watching this while sitting on the toilet. Now I'm looking around thinking, oh my God, he's right. Well, you know, some people got to do their work in all the right places, I guess there, <laughs> but I would check Chuck on how much time you're spending there. If you're burning out, uh, by spending too much time in the smallest room of your home, you know, I, I, I it occurred to me, I was, I, I was needing this to go out and, and go out to eat at fine dining places more often. I went up to Sundance uh, Deer Valley uh, or Sundance, the Sundance uh, 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 Robert Redford's joint, old joint, um, the Sundance Ski Resort. Um, a, a couple weeks ago, I went out to uh, this, this lake restaurant that has fine dining and literally the patio sits on the lake and I'm uh. just sitting there enjoying this thing. And you know what I'm sitting there with? You know what I brought with me? My laptop a mouse and my headphones, uh, which yeah, I like my headphones. They give me some peace because they're, they block out sound of you know, all the other noise and idiocy that I hear when I go out to eat in Utah, <clears throat> but I'm sitting there and I open up my laptop and I'm sitting on the water. Like the, the, you know, the, how the porch goes over the water. Yes. I'm sitting there at the edge of the water at my dining table, waiting for my food. And I open up my laptop and I've got this beautiful panacea of the uh, the big uh, the Tipinogos, uh, uh mountain in the thing, this beautiful sunset that's starting to go down. And as somebody looks at me from across the dining room table, like, like seriously? Like, mm -hmm. you're going to do that here? And you have this view. People in boats are going by and stuff. And it's just a, it's just a wonderful thing, which will be gone soon once snow comes. And I, I, I said, yeah, what am I doing, man? And I'm like, I'm going to do some work. <laughs> and I, I close my laptop. I'm like, shut up. Sit here and enjoy yes. the view, idiot boy. So there you go. But there I love go. that you caught yourself, right? And so much of what I talk about in the book is that self-awareness. Because if you're not even aware that you're doing it, you can't stop it, right? Mm -hmm. But as soon as you can get your brain trained to start gut checking and going, wait a second, we said we weren't going to work right now. And we started to work. Hold on. How do I want to progress? How do I want to move forward? Then you're going to be able to train your brain not to do those things in the future. So <laughs> there is an element of just like kudos to you for having that self-awareness. There you go. I need to hook electric shop therapy up to me when I do stuff like that. And go. <laughs> but I've been more mindful over this past week or two that I listened to the um, Sam Harris podcast uh, uh, guest. And I've been more mindful that, hey, you need to have more just, just peace and quiet. Mm -hmm. like don't don't take things to distract yourself don't don't do so spend some time with your thoughts and it's almost like we're kind of afraid to spend time alone with ourselves and in our thoughts yeah because sometimes we're actually afraid of what they're going to tell us i mean and i remember that very much with you know wanting to leave corporate like mm -hmm. what do you mean thought i'm supposed to leave my job my security of my paycheck although let's be real that is a false sense of security because all the companies i worked at always were having layoffs and rifts but there was something that felt secure about being on somebody else's payroll and so it's like it's very hard for us to detach from those thoughts and and be willing to take the feedback from our own brain that like, no, this isn't actually working. We need to do something different. There you go. Now on your, on your uh, book, 
you uh, talk about different things, identifying what you want out of life so you can achieve success on your own terms. And I imagine that is kind of framed around uh, imagining what you now newly want or maybe how things aren't working for you. Because obviously you, you may have achieved what you want and then you're not happy with it, right? Yeah, uh, I see that a lot of times. You know, somebody goes to school, they think this is the thing. They got their master's degree. This is the thing they're going to want to do. And they're like, shoot, it, it, this isn't fulfilling me. Mm -hmm. And what, what do I do? Should I just stay and keep doing it or switch back and do something else? Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, we go through that. You go through a lot of cathartic times. I've been through on a million, I call them my adventure uh, times or periods of my life where, you know, I, I'll take five years and I'll be like, I want to be a professional photographer and I'll buy like, you know, $10,000 worth of cameras and crap. And, uh, and then I'll go play with that for a while. And then, you know, I'm like, I don't know, I'm bored of this. I don't really, it's not really sticking. Thank God podcast is the one thing that I enjoy and it's stuck with. In fact, it's the thing I love the most, but, uh, um, it, it, other than that, it's just, you know, you, you go through these times in your life where is this all there is, or sometimes you realize you, um, you, you, you adopted uh, things in life that were kind of socially put on you, yes. you know, cause you know, there's, a, I mean, I, I think it's probably different for women uh, because there's a lot of social pressure and then fam familial pressure that comes to their family. When are you going to have kids? You know, all that right. stuff. Um, you know, for me, there was a great line that kind of a, a talks about that in a fight club where uh, I think Brad Pitt's sitting in the, um, in the bathtub and, and he says, you know, I don't know. My, my dad told me, to, you know, when I grew up, graduate high school, I graduated high school. What do I do now, dad, I go get a job or go to college, you know, uh, oh, I went to college and then go get a job. He's like, we're living these lives that, you know, are just being told mm -hmm. to us. And like, we're not really giving any thought to what do I want to do? Like, yeah. do I really want to do this? Totally. And that's what Grab Life by the Dreams is all about. Like you, you have a dream that was put inside your heart and it's in there and it's probably been there for quite some time, mm -hmm. although it may have changed or it may be a new development and just giving ourselves permission to acknowledge them and to go after them is so freeing. And that's what a lot of people aren't doing. They're just not giving themselves permission to explore it because of all the things that society has told them about how you're supposed to adult or, you know, live your life. Mm -hmm. And I had, I, a, oh God, I, I did that last week. I left, uh, I left the, uh, thunder down under, uh, strip club in Vegas. And my dream is to be on the Chippendales team. Uh -huh. So I'm working to that right now. Good luck. I'm gonna, I hope you manifest that, you know, <laughs> keep putting it out in the, in the universe and you never know what could come your way. You never know. You never know. I had to <laughs> hang up the thong after 40 years at, uh, thunder down under. I don't know what that means. Um, Great. you talk about something in your book called <laughs> the, the simple proven four step process to truly edit, edit and capitalize letters, your life. Tell us what that is. Yeah. So edit is the methodology that I came up with for my coaching program, for my one-on-one -on -one coaching. And so let me tell you first how it sort of came to fruition. When I was working with my first editor and I would send him a chapter for the book, you know, I noticed how he never threw out the whole chapter. Like he was never mm. like, Karen, this is all garbage. Toss it out, start over. But he might say something like, hey, you know, let's take the punchline and move it here or let's save this for the end. And, you know, he would just kind of tweak some things. And then we'd read through it and be like, ding, this is a, a really good chapter. OK, super. Moving on. Next chapter. Right. And life coaching, I have found, is so similar in that we're not throwing out your whole life just because you need a life coach doesn't mean that things are necessarily all bad. Mm. But there's a couple of tweaks and changes that you can make to make your life better, to have a better chance of achieving whatever it is that you want. So edit stands for envision the goal, mm. document the goal, invest in the goal, and take action. There you go. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Envisioning the goal is all about like that dreaming big. Like, let's just forget right now about the how. Don't worry about the how, but what mm -hmm. are the things that you're interested in? What would that look like for you to change your life? And we, and we look at it from different areas, from your career, from your relationships, from your spirituality, from your financial situation. Um, you know, so a bunch of different things, physical environment, right? Like all this stuff. What would that ideally look like? Okay, great. Now let's prioritize because we can't do it all at once. Mm -hmm. Take the top three or so things and let's document it. Get those dreams out of your head and onto paper. Make a plan. You know, we deal with smart goals and all those good things to actually make it tangible. 
And then we move into investing in the goal. And every time I say investing, everyone's brain automatically goes to money, <laughs> right? Oh, well, I don't have the money for that. It's not always about money. What are you investing your time you're in? You know, people say, oh, I don't have time to start a business. I don't have time to write a book like you did, Karen. BS. Yes, you don't. What do you do every night from seven to nine? Oh, I sit and watch TV. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's your two hours a day. That's oh, 10 yeah. hours a week. Like, come on, you know, let's, so let's be intentional about, about our time. Mm -hmm. um, you might want to invest in people. What are the relationships you need to build to help open doors for there you? you. What are the, um, uh, it's a, a little acronym I came up with temple. So time, energy, money, people and learning. So what's oh. the learning and development or the skills that you need to help you get to the next level or whatever you're trying to achieve. There you and go. then lastly, take action. And it, it sounds so simple, but you'd be amazed how many people come up with a plan and then they don't do the right things to actually move the ball forward. So uh, that's where a coach comes in really handy because we can help you be accountable and following through on those actions week to week and making sure you don't get off track. There you go. Accountability and accountability partners are really helpful. That's how I got my book written. And uh, I actually need to go find a new one for the new book um, because it's uh, it's still in in the thing. Um, it, it, I love the edit process because do, do a lot of people maybe they're not thinking that, hey, you can edit your life, right? You don't have to just you don't have to just get sick of everything and just go, I'm leaving yes. and, you know, go fake your death like I did uh, <laughs> my first five marriages. Um, you know, you, you can you can actually be like, hey, you know, we can tweak this. Mm -hmm. We can edit it. We can we can fine tune it down to what we need it to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I talk a lot about change, too, and how you can navigate change. Um, there's so much fear that comes up when we start to take a step. I mean, there's excitement, too. Right. But, mm -hmm. you know, are the fear is often much stronger of an emotion that, that we have to deal with. And so making sure that you don't backslide. And, you know, a lot of my clients come to me and then they start romanticizing. Well, this role isn't really that bad. I mean, I could probably slug it out for like another year. And I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> you just told me the other day you were crying in a bad bathroom and this that the other oh you're right okay that's fridays around here oh oh no that's the worst i've cried in a lot of bathrooms and cars and conference rooms and you know you name it all right Good times <laughs> the uh I, it's 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 you know thinking realizing you can edit your life i think it makes it get you out of a mentality that you might feel that you're stuck in I think that's where a lot of people suffer and they get punchy and they, maybe they're crying in bathrooms or they, you know, they get elbows and, you know, the, the anger things you mentioned, some of the things when you're going into some of your uh, boardroom meetings and stuff, you're, you're a little, uh, uh, um, you know, and, and I think that's because we do feel stuck and, and we've, and as, as we've alluded to in your book, you know, people need to try and figure out ways to get unstuck. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of us who are self-medicating, right? Or mm. numbing the pain. And I do talk openly about my relationship with drinking. Ah. Uh, certainly not judging anyone or telling anyone that you shouldn't drink. But it was one of those behaviors for me that I had to look at and go, is this serving me? How is mm. how is this serving me? And what I found was it was much, very much a self-sabotaging behavior. You know, it was mm. a way for me to escape and then it also was the thing that I could blame, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'd also share about reward systems because whenever you're moving towards a new goal or a new dream, you want to have a reward for yourself, a way to celebrate your big milestones. But my reward would come back to drinking. Oh, you know, signed a new client. Great. Have a cocktail or do this. <laughs> go party on the town. And I was like, well, this isn't serving me. I'm, I'm basically rewarding myself with something that's going to take me back mm. off track. And so being honest with yourself about these things and yeah, there's so much that you are going to get in this book that is just going to blow the doors open for you. And you're like, wow, there's there a lot go. of little things that you can start to make. And, and talk about feeling stuck. You alluded to something that you mentioned on your website, your health, uh, you think is an afterthought and you're just too tired to bother working out or, or doing other things. That's another place where you can feel stuck and really ground down. And, you know, I, I drank pretty heavy for 20 years. Um, and I, for a lot of times it seemed to be a fuel for me. It was like, mm -hmm. Hey, I got all this, you know, I was running three companies at the same time. Like I got all this paperwork to do. I got all this crap I got to do. Uh, let's have some vodka and, uh, Hey, you know, some Red Bull and, 
wow, you know, I'm jacked up for another three hours where we can get the, all this paperwork done and stuff. You know, as an entrepreneur, it, it just, you live, sleep, drink, eat business and it, uh, mm -hmm. it's not healthy but neither was what i was doing to myself you know chemically abusing my body and you know the next morning you wake up you're off your game you're de dehydrated for two or three days um you know now i live a much better life where i don't drink um it, it's it's really kind of weird because people go oh you don't drink you have a problem or something no i didn't yeah. uh i just actually i just i just said hey man i started listening to my body and went my body says, uh, I, I don't like this anymore. I hit 50 and my, my body was like, fuck you. If you want to do yep. this, we're going to make this really fucking miserable for you for three days afterwards. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I see. I, I think you can win this negotiation because uh, yeah. it's not working good. But, you know, eating healthy, eating right. That's probably some other things you talk about in the book yeah. or balancing yeah. your coaching clients. Working out, of course. Mm -hmm. And it's like we're pouring into everyone else. It's best men too, but women, you know, we, we get, we're a little extra when it comes mm -hmm. to taking care of everybody else first before we take care of ourselves. And so the first thing to go out the window is that 20 minute run in the morning, you know, we're getting mm -hmm. on the treadmill at night. It's like, well, no, I'm tired and I got to bring Johnny to soccer and this one needs, you know, help with their science homework. And so we forget about ourselves. And mm -hmm. of course, I'm not trying to breed a bunch of like self-centered women here or anything, but at some point we enough is enough and we have to fill our own cup first. And so I'm giving sure. you permission to do that in the book and to prioritize your own health and well-being. There you go. I mean, if you don't take care of yourself first, you don't have anything left to give to other people. Exactly. That or you just have this torn and tattered, beaten up, run down, burnout uh, person, which is, uh, I think I just described myself. I think yeah. <laughs> Is that my Tinder well, profile? Yeah. <laughs> I think it is. That's not going to help you. I can tell you that. No. <laughs> it, it, clearly it's not. So there you go. I have no, I have no DMs. So there you go. Well, let's see. And that's so funny because it's like so many people are like, but Karen, I'm afraid to try this new thing. What if I'm not happy? I'm like, you're not happy now. So what do you got to lose? <laughs> like, let, let's be real. I like okay? that realization. You catch them on. It's already not working. Mm -hmm. What do you have to lose? Try it this way and let's see how it goes. And then they come back and like, oh, yeah, you know, it, it totally. I feel so much better now that I worked out or, oh, I actually went out to dinner the other night and didn't bring my work phone. Guess what? Nothing blew up. I didn't get fired. I'm like, OK, see, we could start to wheel back the amount of hours you're working. And yeah. There you go. And just just taking that space for yourself, like we talked about earlier, uh, Je Jennifer says, uh, when I hike, that's the best time to completely oh. plug out nature tech, zero I tech. Hiking. I like that. I like that concept of hiking because, you know, I, I'll do that from time to time. Like I, I go sit in my backyard to soak up some vitamin D and, and make sure we get the get all the uh, 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 was it the uh, the. I forget what they call them, the rhythms. There's uh, these rhythms that you can start, your circadian rhythms oh, yeah. for your sleep and stuff like that. And then the vitamin D is good for you from the sun. And so I'll do that. But then i like tempted to bring my phone out. And I'm like, mm -hmm. no, go out and play with the dogs, be in nature, you know, contemplate the universe. Leave, leave it alone, man. You're going to be okay for 10, 20, 15 minutes, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is really insightful, all the stuff you have in your book. What, what haven't we talked about uh, that we should tease out for people to pick up your book and, and of course, uh, call you up to work for you or on your reach out on your website? Yeah, for sure. Well, one of the things I love talking about is confidence, right? And I think there's so many misconceptions about confidence, what it is, how you get it. You know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you're um, an extrovert, Karen. You've always been confident. And I'm like, ah, not, there's no scientific data actually to back that up. There is no scientific proof that extroverts are any more confident than introverts. And yeah. I share a story from um, a time that I was on the corporate jet. I won't spoil it here. You have to go read the book. Uh, and I clearly was an extrovert, but mm -hmm. in that moment, I write, I had no confidence. So mm -hmm. I want to share a definition. So whether you get the book or not, you're going to get my definition for what I believe confidence is. And this is probably counterintuitive to anything you've ever heard before. So I'm just going to read it for you. So I don't botch it. Confidence is a deep trust in your own capabilities and a desire to try something new or different. Mm. Understanding that even if things don't work out as intended, you'll have learned something in the process. Mm. 
So if anyone's mind is exploding, it doesn't say being right all the time. It doesn't say having no fear or everything feeling great and, you know, no pain or discomfort when you try something new. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions. So I hope that that definition will be um, freeing for some of you and let you see that, hey, as long as you're willing to try something and you trust that you can figure it out and you know that you're going to learn something, it's not really a failure if it doesn't go right. Like, like you are, that is being confident. There you go. And confidence helps if you want to achieve what you want to do. So as we go out, Karen, uh, give yeah. us your final thoughts, final pitch on the book. Okay. Go get Grab Life by the Dreams, available wherever books are sold. This book is going to change your life and take you from stuck and frustrated to really figuring out that intentional life that you want to live. So get out of the passenger seat and into the driver's seat. There you go. People love the definition from the audience there. Thanks, oh, Matthew. thank you. There you go. I hope it's uh, helpful. Order up the book, Matthew. I think I think it sounds like a book that's great for guys too, you know, both men and women. I think anybody can enjoy it, right? I go. do share a lot of my client examples, the women that I work with. So it's written mm -hmm. with a, a lens towards women. But I mean, all the stuff in there is applicable to anyone. Yeah. Everybody goes through the cathartic times of life and goes, hey, you know what? I don't think I like what I'm doing. And I, I think uh, some of the signals we talked about is, you know, when you're miserable or when you're unhappy, and it should be like, hey, wh why am I so unhappy? Uh, I don't know. Uh, we just we just call it Fridays around here, whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> so, Karen, thank you very much for coming on the show. Give us your dot coms. Where can people find you on the interwebs, and how can they reach out to you too to uh, uh, talk to you about potential coaching, et cetera, et cetera? Sure. So, KarenFreeland.com. You can go to the Life Coaching tab and book an Edit Your Life Jumpstart call. We'll talk for forty five minutes, see what your big vision is, what's holding you back, and make a game plan for going forward together. And if you want to go to check out more about the book, KarenFreeland.com forward slash dreams. There you go. Uh, thank you very much, Karen, for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. it's been fun. My pleasure. There thank you, you go. Uh, thanks to our audience for tuning in. As always, thanks for our commenters and the people who sent in some of the comments. Uh, some got made on the show. Some are funny as hell. Uh, and there you go. And I hope Chuck gets out of the bathroom there. Uh, but, you know, I mean, if a job is a job, there you go. Just do it well, as, as always. And uh, I don't have any further jokes. I'm going to leave that one alone. Uh, go to goodreadsfolks.com uh, uh, for Chess Chris Foss. Tell them Chris Foss saying Go to YouTube, LinkedIn and TikTok and see the Chris Foss show over there as well. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.